Uh, let's continue to think about evidence for God's existence. He says he's revealed himself. He's revealed his power. He's revealed his creative wisdom. And let's think of ways we see him. So we talked about the cosmological argument and the teleological argument, which are both from external general revelation, what we see when we look around us. Uh, but now I want to think about several evidences for God's existence in common human experience. So the cosmological, that there has to be a cause for everything we see, for reality, sufficient to what it is. And then the teleological, there's obvious design to everything we see. Well, now what do we find about God? What points us to God? What points us to the, the reality of God? When we look inside common human experiences, these are internal general revelation. What is true of the, the common human experience that points us to God? It's been interesting because uh, in my life as I've talked to people about God and tried to do apologetics or reason with people about my faith, it's been interesting to see a shift that take, has taken place related to what we were talking about last night of an increasing value put on our experience as individuals, subjectively, what, what is, effect does this have to me? I talked about Tim Keller having his series on the resurrection and then not having much pushback on the reality of miracles or the supernatural. A lot of people increasingly buy into that sort of thing. It, the, the challenges to the Christian view of things used to come from a more naturalistic, scientific way of thinking, but now the challenges come from more of an existential way of thinking. What effect does this have in my life? Does this resonate with what's true of me? And by the way, I th I'm, I'm going to write a book eventually when I get to it uh, called something like um, 25 Things Christians Should Probably Stop Saying. Um, <laughs> and th there will be uh, several in there. But but one of, one of the words I hear a lot more as Christians, which has something fine and good, and I'm not saying stop using it, but more and more, especially my students, they will say, man, that really resonates with me. Uh, the word resonating, which means my heart's going like this, and this thing is resonating, right? It's, it's going at the same resonation, I guess, right? So, um, well, that's fine when that happens, but, but I hope... You aren't just looking for things that resonate with you in your life. I hope you're looking for things that sometimes um, cause some disequilibration, knock you off balance a little bit. I hope you don't go to the Bible only seeking to find things resonating, but are seeking at times to find things that defy the way things are going in your mind and heart. God should tick you off now and then. He really should, or you're probably not paying attention. You're probably just conforming what you find in the word to how you're already thinking and that's not not why you, sometimes you go for a firm affirmation but but sometimes not but that's not to say though that God created us in his image we're more like God than anything else that is he made us like himself and he he built into human beings when he made us Certain desires, certain inclinations, certain feelings, certain ways of thinking that are fundamental to what it means to be human that actually point us to the reality of God. So although we can overdo the subjective, although we can overdo our experience, there is great value in recognizing common human experience because it actually points us to God. It points us to desires He's instilled in us for Himself ultimately. And so it's very important to think about what it means to be human and common human experiences and then ask, well, how do you explain this? And the first argument from internal general revelation is what we call the argument from personality. And this is basically, this is how Francis Schaeffer put it in his book um, uh, where he, he dealt with this. The impersonal plus time plus chance can never yield the personal. And that that's true. So, um, tell me your name again. Anthony. Anthony. So, I hope you can all see the difference between this bottle of water and Anthony. Right? Immediately, I hope obvious differences come to mind. And what are the fundamental differences between this thing 
and this person? What makes Anthony a person and this bottle a thing? What are the main differences between Anthony and this bottle that make him a person that's a thing? Oh, he has life. Okay, so life is clearly a difference. This is a lifeless thing. But that doesn't distinguish this bottle as a thing and Anthony as a person because plants have life, right? Um, so so what, are, what are the things that make Anthony a person and this not? What is it? Yes, he has rational capability. He reasons. He, he has a rational capacity. Good. This does not think. Right? What else? What else are the big differences? Say again. He has feelings, right? He has an emotional life. The bottle does not, as far as I know. I don't think it does. No. <laughs> right? Um, no emotional life. Good. He doesn't, it doesn't have feelings. Anthony does, don't you? Yes. <laughs> and I'm sure you're very in touch with them as a... A 21st century man. Yes. Um, other differences? Okay, so the brain, reasoning capability, okay. But um, flesh isn't necessarily a personal reality, right? So what else? What else is true of a person? that? It, Oh, personality, right. So we're actually at, that's the big word for what we're asking. What, what makes a personality? What is it? So he has a sense of humor, right? What's more human than laughter? Humans are the only things that laugh. Laughing hyenas do not laugh. <laughs> I will never for the, forget the first time I actually heard a laughing hyena. I thought, that does not sound like a laugh to me. That sounds evil to me. Uh, but but uh, it, he, only humans laugh. I think it was Mark Twain who said, and only humans blush, and they're the only creatures that need to. <laughs> That's good. So uh, it's true, morally, we're the only ones with moral accountability. But um, good, so relational ability, how about that? It, this, Anthony has relationships, don't you? With friends and yes, um, yes, you have relationships, relation ability. So, so how about will, right? Volition and will. Uh, if I were to smack Anthony, he may smack me back. You never know, or he may use his will to be a pacifist in that moment. But this bottle has no will. It it doesn't act. It's not an acting thing. It it does. It will never go to the supermarket and liberate the other water bottles who are trapped there. Right? It'll never start a revolution, a revolt, a revival. It'll never use its will to act on its reasoning or its emotions to do something. So we are seeing that Anthony, as a person, is a very amazing and complex thing unlike this bottle. And we also recognize that complex things are capable of making simpler things, but it never goes in the other direction. A bottle will never make a person. A simpler thing, a lesser thing, will never be responsible for a complex and greater thing. Lesser things don't make greater things. It's the opposite. Persons can make bottles. Bottles will never make persons. Things do not create... Per How do you explain a person apart from a person? How do you explain the reality of, the creation of this thing we just call a person that has a personality? How do you explain rationality? volition and, and will how do you explain sense of humor and relational capability in the incredible things human beings can do if you don't have a personal creator making us like himself do you know of anything that creates something that is more complex than it is now, computers may seem that way but they're nothing compared to the human mind and so how do you explain persons? How do you explain the, the, the sheer existence of a person without a personal creator who is personal, who has mind, volition, will, relational capability, sense of humor, all of these amazing capacities of persons? How do you explain that apart from a personal being behind it all? You really can't. 
Now, I don't think these arguments we're using right now prove God. These are often called proofs for the existence of God. Um, and, and so what's the sense of these? What, what's the use of these? Well, I think the way we're arguing right now, and I want to pause and think about it this way, these really cause two things to happen. One, if you're an atheist, if you don't believe there's a God, then these evidences really should make you say, hmm, and scratch your head and wonder if your atheistic view really matches with reality. If, if you don't have evidence that there's something far beyond mere impersonal, mechanistic, naturalistic, chaotic chance. How do you explain a person? Something we get very used to. Again, so much of these uh, evidences we miss because we just get so used to them. You get used to persons. Like I said, at Disneyland, I just want to get on the ride and all those things made in the image and likeness of God are nothing but annoyances. (laughs) But they're incredible. Human beings are astounding in what God's made. How do you explain the wonder of a human being, of a person, apart from something sufficient to create that person? The impersonal, plus all the time you got and all the chance you could ever have, will never yield the personal. That's the argument from personality. Uh, Oh, and the the other thing that these arguments do in, in, in addition to making someone who doesn't believe in God scratch their head, is it takes the revelation we have of God and it's, it makes us say, oh, yes. As I look around in the world, this, this God I find in the Bible is the only way to explain everything I see. One of the main reasons I believe the Bible is because it, I've never seen a better explanation for reality as I know it than the Bible. It's amazing. It's explanatory power for the human condition, the human experience in the world as we know it is astounding. I've never seen anything close. I have a friend who uh, was, he was after college playing professional basketball in Italy for a team owned by the mafia. Um, and so he was living large. He, he was just, he, had, he was getting well paid, well taken care of by this team owned by the mafia. And his life was going down the tubes. And one day he was in a hotel room and he pulled out a Gideon's Bible out of a hotel room in Italy. And he just opened it up and it opened to the book of Ecclesiastes. And isn't it interesting? Every time I, I, I know of a non-Christian who has a Bible, I always want to be there looking over their shoulder saying, oh, no, 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 not Leviticus. I, I just... Uh, go, go over here and, and guide and direct. We need to just trust the word and trust God. He opens to Leviticus, and in one sitting, he reads the entire book of Leviticus. He closes the Bible and says, whoever wrote this knows me too well to not have created me. He, he was describing his condition of, of the emptiness he felt. The Bible explains the human experience, the human condition, and the world as we know it far better than any other explanation I've ever seen. Uh, it's amazing. It's explanatory power. And so, so it, it bolsters our belief that we already have. So it causes us to scratch our heads and consider the revelation of God in special revelation. But it also makes us, those who, of, as a, of us who believe in special revelation, it bolsters our faith and says, oh yes, this coheres clearly with what I'm experiencing. And so the, the second argument from internal general revelation, uh, argument number four overall, is the argument from beauty and the love of beauty or aesthetics. Um, you artists will love this one. It, it just argues this. Every human being and every human culture throughout history has had a concept of the beautiful understands what that is and deeply appreciates it and pursues it this is fascinating and this does not fit with with a merely evolutionary view of humans if it's survival of the fittest what is this thing we deeply know, long for, appreciate, and invest great resources into sometimes to able, be able to experience. Now, this does, not demean, this does not mean like everything else, we don't distort and pervert truth 
and even what's beautiful. And it doesn't mean there isn't a relative, at times, understanding of what we find beautiful. But the fact is, if you look at a sunset and you think it's ugly, you're wrong. <laughs> you are just wrong. And, and just because we may have distortion in our ability to appreciate beauty doesn't mean it's not beautiful and that we have an understanding of what this thing is it's a pretty wild thing that human beings even that display of food had a beauty to it didn't it the colors of just the fruit tray just the colors of the fruit it, it, it wasn't just nutrition was it we went in there and we looked at that beautiful display of food including including muchi pumpkin uh, squares who, who made those did somebody make those so, I'm so glad someone pointed out the fusion of American and Asian food there. Because I, I forget that pumpkin is very American and way overdone these, this time of year as well. Um, it's in everything. Uh, but, but I loved it. It was so, so delightful. And how, how fun that is. The, the food is a visual thing. And there's a beauty to food. And there's a beauty all around us. And we all get it. And it's fascinating. It's hard to explain and describe what beauty is. But we know how it makes us feel. How does beauty make you feel? Good. What are other feelings? How would you describe the effect of beauty on you? Joy, Joy yeah. What else? Awe, oh, yeah. You say awe, oh, yeah. Um, other, other feelings you have when you see something beautiful? Amazed, yes. Awe, oh, who said calm? Yeah. There's a, oh, a Talbot student, I'm not surprised. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> a sense of calm, isn't there? That's really big. So yes, I think all these things are true. But right at the heart of beauty, isn't it a... Oh, beauty just makes you say, oh, you don't have the sense of, oh, I need to fix that. Right? I need to adjust that. Where's my eraser? I remember there were these amazing drawings of the life of Christ in the Billy Graham Center where I worked when I was at Wheaton. And, and they were on display for months. And then there was a day the artists were there. They were pencil drawings. And, and they were amazing drawings. I've got them all burned in my mind because I worked in the, the Billy Graham Center. And they were there in the museum. And there were about uh, 30 of these incredible drawings. And I was standing there. And the artist, who was an elderly man, came in. And he was there. And I'm, so we're standing next to one of his drawings. And I'm asking him all these questions. And he's looking at me. And he, he looks at the painting. And he looks again. And he looks at the painting. And he reached in his pocket pulled out a pencil and added a little something to it. It was like, what are, what are you doing? Oh, I guess you get to do that, right? Uh, you're the artist. It was bizarre that you have these drawings on the wall. And he, and he even flipped it around and had an eraser. And he, he just took this little thing. He just didn't like some. Well, as the artist, he has the right to do that. But when we see something beautiful, we, we say, oh, that's so good. It's so beautiful. It brings a sense of peace, a sense of rest, because there's an orderliness to it. There's a symmetry to it. There's a melody to it. There's a beauty to it that we feel like this is what I was created for. I was created to be at peace in the presence of beauty. Yeah, and across human history and across human cultures, human beings have all had this sense of beauty. Have you ever thought about, if it's just survival of the fittest, have you ever thought about how utterly stupid it is to invest billions of dollars into places like the Getty? If you haven't been to the Getty, go today. <laughs> Don't wait any longer. The, the Getty, I, I think it was a billion dollars for that structure, wasn't it? And then we take paintings that we give millions of dollars of worth to and we put them on walls and we go and walk around and just stand there looking at them. You know how weird that is? If there isn't something called beauty 
that draws us from the deepest recesses of our being toward it? How do you explain it? If this is just molecules, atoms, mechanistic, random, impersonal chance, what is this thing beauty? It really should have been removed from the whole evolutionary process a long time ago because all it does is siphon off resources to things that aren't survival. They're just something way bigger and deeper than that. How do you explain that? How do you explain that all human beings have a sense of beauty? Yes, we get it messed up, and we might even disagree at times, but we all know there's this thing called beauty, and we know how precious it is and how it makes us feel. And we will go to great lengths, like hiking all day, just to see it, right? That's really strange. If we weren't created by an, an artist, if, if we weren't created by an artist who instilled in all of us a deep understanding of, appreciation for, and longing for beautiful, the beautiful is something we're created for. If we're not created by an artist who gave us this human instinct that's universal, how do you explain this thing called a love for beauty? I, I don't know how. Another reason to say, yeah, that, that really makes no sense apart from a divine artist who made us and gave us that capacity. Comments, questions, anything at this point? Okay, let's keep going. The argument for morality, C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, uh, begins with this, and it is a compelling argument. If you've never read the beginning of Mere Christianity, at least, please read it. It's, it's a, a powerful case for the existence of God from what Lewis called the argument for morality. And it's this, when we look at ourselves, we see deep inner convictions about right and wrong. This points to a moral order in the universe higher than ourselves. The most likely explanation is that it stems from a moral creator and a judge who is God, who made us. And, and this is a powerful argument for God's existence. Again, across all of human experience, you study through time, uh, all of human experience, we recognize a deep inner understanding of the concept of right and wrong and a pretty clear understanding of what those two things are. Now again, we distort them, we pervert them, we ignore them, we suppress them in unrighteousness. We don't live consistently with them all the time, a lot of the time. But it's there nonetheless. This idea that there is right and wrong is hard to explain, apart from a moral creator who gave us a sense of right and wrong. But the specificity of it is especially hard to understand. That Across human history and across human cultures, human beings overwhelmingly have recognized that those Ten Commandments, maybe not the first three as much, but those Ten Commandments of don't steal, don't take what doesn't belong to you, don't be greedy, don't covet, don't commit adultery. There's a, a, been a sense of morality throughout human history universally, overwhelmingly understood by human beings. And from culture to culture and religion to religion, there is a common way human beings have seen right and wrong as long as we can, can remember human beings existing. So how do you explain that? How do you explain that even though people like to talk like morality is relative and subjective, Nobody really deep down believes that. Just push people on that. Because I've never met anybody who claims to be a moral relativist who doesn't have a strong sense of right and wrong. Even if their strong sense of right and wrong is that you should be a moral relativist. They're very committed to that. And if you listen to Oprah Winfrey preach, she often preaches moral relativity, but the very fact that she's preaching, it shows she believes things are right and wrong. And thinks it really matters that you see things, things her way, even though it doesn't sound like that's what she's saying. She is. Everybody's preaching. Everybody's worshiping, and everybody's preaching all the time, based on what they think is right and wrong. And anyone who claims to be a moral relativist, like, oh, it's just subjective. It's just up, up to what you want to do. Um, they don't believe that. They, they really don't. So if you take a key and scratch it along their car, they will not say, oh, that's okay. We talked about this a little bit last night. 
they will say, no, that's not what you do. And the fact that you may say, well, subjectively, my, in my own little moral world, I get to do that. No, you don't. People have a strong sense of right and wrong that drives what they do. How do you explain this apart from a moral law giver who instills in us a sense of right and wrong? It's very hard to explain this, this morality human beings know deep down without a God who gave it to us. Number six, the argument for meaning and significance. And over the years, this is not an argument I have used increasingly, and these days maybe more than any other. And it's this. There's a universal quest for meaning and significance in life that all human beings understand. If we are just things, really, if we're just animals climbing to the top of the food chain, how do you explain this universal human quest for meaning? You are not human if you've never laid in bed at night, stared at the ceiling, and wondered if your life matters. And what's more human than that? What's more human than deep longing for a life of meaning, of purpose, of significance? And we're not even satisfied with a life that's meaningful just in this life. We've got to know that our lives are more than 78 years of pension and then the grave. We've got to know that. And when you lose any sense of meaning, that's when suicide becomes viable, a viable option. That, it was Camus, I believe, who said, the only question really worth asking is why you don't kill yourself today. Um, what, is, what is the purpose for your existence? Why, are, why do you matter? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? Why it, does it matter, especially when life's painful, especially when there are struggles? Why? Why do you do it? What is your life adding up to? What does all this matter anyway? That's what we deep down desperately want to know. And when you remove the God who created us for profound meaning and instilled in us a deep desire for meaning, for purpose, for significance for our lives, when you extract the basis of that, the very possibility of that, life is meaningless and Ecclesiastes is right and that's exactly what my friend Ed was experiencing when he read the description of it in the book of Ecclesiastes. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. It's all emptiness. I've tried it all. And none of it has added up to anything of lasting significance because when you cut yourself off from the things of eternity, all you've got left is meaninglessness. And so, so that's what we experience. But why? Why aren't we okay with lives that are nothing more than stuff? Lives that are nothing more than just going through the motions. Why do we desperately need to know that? I do not think your dog goes to sleep at night wondering where it's all heading. You know, I wonder if my life matters. No, but you're a human being, and you do, don't you? I, I, I just know this. And with so much meaninglessness that people feel, I, I know so many amazing young people who cut themselves because they want to feel alive. They, they want to feel significant, and that gives them a sense of that because they don't get it from anywhere else. How tragic. How tragic that we'll do anything to feel significant, even hurt ourselves. Why? Why do I have this desperate need to know my life matters for something beyond my life? It's got to be because God created us for profound meaning and instilled in every one of us a deep, deep desire to know our lives have significance. You know, Satan has cooked up some fantastic lies from his perspective and, and that are just brilliant, really. Satan's not stupid. He's not. There's a foolishness to him, but it's not because he's stupid. And I, I think if I had to pick his, his most brilliant lie he's ever cooked up, it's this idea that Eastern religions teach that the greatest state you can attain is the absence of all desire. That's what nirvana is, right? 
That's what enlightenment is. It's the absence of all desire. Our biggest problem in Eastern thinking is desire, the very existence of it. And until you banish all desire, until you become at one with yourself and everything else, this is the language you'll use, and have the absence of all desire, you won't be enlightened. You won't achieve nirvana. You, you won't be this uh, greater being that you're, you're to be. Can you think of a better lie? Um, because we feel unfulfilled desires that can sound appealing to us. Because our desires so often aren't met, aren't fulfilled, we think, oh, if I could just get rid of them, I won't feel this anxiety, I won't feel this anxiousness, I won't feel this depression, I won't feel this discouragement. So the solution is not to seek fulfillment in the ways I'm to be fulfilled, it's to get rid of the desire at all. Can you think of a better lie for humans to believe to cut them off from the quest to know God who is our source of meaning? He is our source of significance. Let's just make desire a bad thing. No, desire is a wonderful God-given thing. And ultimately, it's a desire for Him who is our life. We, we were singing that line this morning. Jesus is, is my life. He is my life. And, and to lack the desire that gets me there is deadly. May it never be. And so we need to follow our desires and follow them to the only source that can really fulfill them, and that's God himself. Being connected to our creator, the God of eternity, who not only gives us significance and meaning for this life, but for eternity, that's where we find our meaning that we have a deep desire for. So the argument for meaning and significance says, how do you even explain this deep desire you have for meaning and significance, apart from a God who created you for it? Seven. Um, the argument from religious experience this is the last one we'll look at. It's been said human beings are incurably religious. We may wish they would stop it, like Bill Maher wishes we would all stop being religious. And Christopher Hitchens, these, these, um, these new atheists, they just think religion's the big problem if we could just get rid of it. Uh, religion's the opiate of the people. It's something we've created to to uh, explain things that we don't have explanations for, all these reasons for it, but human beings are incurably religious. All over the world and throughout human history, you will find religious belief and expression. Overwhelmingly. All, it, human beings are worshipful. We, we long to worship. We want to worship. We need to worship. And we do. We do. We need to worship. It's something we deeply long for. I... I um, I was interviewed on, on NBC News a few years ago when Tim Tebow was in the NFL playing for the Broncos and he was taking a knee. He was Tebowing and it was going viral and all these people were Tebowing in all these different places. Just taking a knee and praying in the midst of a football game. And, and people, some people were bothered by it. Some people were upset by how big it had gotten. And so I, I was interviewed on NBC and this, this woman said, I mean, don't you think it's a bit much? to be praying in public. And I, and I said, well, no. I, I, I pray in restaurants. I, people pray. I said, almost everybody prays. Even people who claim to be atheists pray. You've heard the expression, there are, athe there are no atheists in foxholes and cancer wards. And sometimes uh, we don't realize our need for God until we're feeling desperate, but it's amazing how we instinctively pray even if we don't normally think about God at all. And I just said, no, most people pray. Almost everybody prays. And, and it, Christianity is a very public religion. It's a come and see. It's not just a come and see religion. It's, it's go and tell. And so we're telling. And so, uh, and, I, and I said, I had this really rough interaction with this woman who was interviewing me. There was a Jewish, a secular Jewish man who was too, who was really enjoying the conversation. And this woman who obviously was not enjoying it. She was an Asian woman from L.A. And, um, and she said, what do you mean? Um, the majority of people pray in our religious. And I said, oh, it's just true. And, and, she, and, and I said, um, you need to know that atheism is primarily a white, western, uh, male, urban, affluent invention. People, those are the people who tend to be atheists. There are very few atheists who aren't white, male, urban, western, and affluent. Very few. And she said, where do you get that? 
Where are you getting that? And I'm so glad I didn't say what I thought to say, which was, I learned that in 10th grade world civ, that human beings have been very religious throughout all of human history. And, and atheists are actually a very small minority. And even atheists have admitted that they pray when they're desperate. Uh, we have an instinct to worship. We're, we are incurably religious, it's been said. How do you explain this? How do you explain this overwhelming instinct to worship, this overwhelming realization that there is someone, something to whom we are accountable, to whom we have to answer, to whom we should offer sacrifice in some way, to, to whom we should worship. I, my father-in-law is a, uh, an atheist, a strong, committed atheist who mocks my beliefs, and, um, and he's sarcastic and witty and quick and uh, loves to mock. And, and th for the decades I've known him, he's, he's mocked my faith. And there's been only a couple of times that um, he hasn't come back with a witty, sarcastic answer to something I've said, even if it, does, it doesn't make sense. He, he comes back with something, right? He, he's not inclined to say, hmm, good point, let me think about that. No, he comes back, but there are only two times he seemed to be stopped in his tracks. One of the times was I said, so you're telling me your dear daughter Donna, to whom I married, is nothing but molecules and atoms, and if she died today, she'd just end up being dust in the ground and nothing else. He didn't have a smart comeback for that. And the only other time, he and I were in a canoe in Maine, out on a, on a lake, and it was an incredible starry night in Maine. <laughs> Maine's one of those places where you realize, oh, there are more, more stars than I realized, right? <laughs> uh, and, and we're just sitting there on this quiet lake, loons, we're listening to loons, Ooh, you ever hear loons? Oh, they're amazing. That was a bad imitation. Uh, so we're listening to loons out on the, on the lake at night. We're sitting under this main sky, and we're just sitting there silent for about 20 minutes. And I finally turned to him, and I said, Hey, what's it like to feel all that worship and not know where to go with it? And he didn't say anything because I knew he was feeling worshipful. I knew deep down he wanted to express worship. And he, he knows it's not appropriate to actually ascribe it to the stars, to the loons, but, but something in him deeply wanted to worship. And it's true, isn't it? How in the world do you explain this? If it's just a random, chaotic chance how do you explain this overwhelming human instinct to worship this need even to worship to respect to honor something greater than ourselves apart from a god who made us instilled in us a worshipful instinct and created us for just that more than anything else okay that's all i got uh what do you want to talk about comments questions Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. How about ugliness? Good question. Um, yeah, I had a pink. See, the, have you noticed my pinkies? I've got jacked up pinkies. The, some orthopedic surgeons call these receiver fingers. I was a receiver for years, and I played with some good quarterbacks. And this, I have it, these pinkies to prove it. And. Um, and these get dislocated all the time. This one, before it was fused, there's only one, there's no joint here. It used to be like that. It used to be on a 90. Is that a 45? That's a 90, right? It used to be on a 90. So I'd get up, and I'd see students going, oh. <laughs> like, and and I, it hurt all the time. It was permanently dislocated, and it really started to hurt. It became arthritic, so I just, they just fused it. And there's just one bone here. But, but, but it, my immediate impression very often with people was the ugliness of my finger. And people, would, they would physically recoil. Other, it was bizarre, though, because I would have other students for the whole semester. And they're like, no, I never noticed. Um, <laughs> but, 
but people would want to set it for me. And, but it was ugly. It was ugly all the time. And, and so I lived with deformity uh, before they fused. It's this one. You could still say that one's a little deformed. But, um, but we need to recognize that there's deformity, that there is ugliness in the world. And then two things I want to say about this. We need to, as Christians, be able to see beauty even in ugliness. I know of very thing, I know of things that have a beauty. Uh, so the hands of uh, somebody who worked as a rancher his whole life with, with calluses and, and uh, scars and dislocated fingers, there's a beauty to what that represents. Um, and so Christians are people who can see beauty in ugliness. The cross is a very ugly thing. The cross is as ugly as anything could ever be. But Christians are those people who le learn to see beauty in the ugliness because we know God's at work in the beauty as well. Sometimes most in the most pronounced way. So we need to learn to see beauty in the midst of ugliness, acknowledge ugliness, and realize that the ugliness, that is true ugliness of deformity, uh, of, of chaos, of distortion has an explanation from a Christian worldview and it's the fall of human beings. It's getting out of sorts with our creator so things spin out of control and we get disorder in the midst of the order. And, and so we have an explanation for that and the only reason we do is because we have an assumption of order, an assumption of design, an assumption of things being good and right and as they should be and as they will be one day when he makes all things right and wipes away every tear and takes away all the deformities except for Jesus' scars, which is fascinating. Um, but but we, we recognize beauty in the ugliness. We have a definition of ugliness because we have the beauty and the order, and we realize the, the ugliness will be taken away one day, and um, we have an explanation for it. It's sin. It's, it's rebelling against our Creator and things getting out of kilter and the fall and the curse distorting things in reality in the midst of the amazing order. Um, yeah, does that help? Okay. What else? Comments, questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. You get to know them and, and you say, what a person that is. Yeah. And I didn't realize it until I got to know them. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's what I mean about seeing amazing beauty, even in the midst of deformity. I mean, I had things that made people feel queasy about my body, but I hope they can see beauty in the midst of that. But I, come on, a possum's ugly. I am sorry. It, uh, <laughs> now there's I've learned to appreciate possums because they serve us well, but but there are things that have an ugliness to them um, that I think are because of the fall, like distorted fingers or um, or things that have an ugliness. I've often wondered if there are animals that are almost entirely a result of the fall and not the original creation, like <laughs> like a roach, a cockroach. Is that is that really in the Garden of Eden, right? Um, certainly not like it is now, right? So, um, yeah. Okay, good. What else? Yes, sir. I'm not sure. Maybe this is just more on this topic. Uh, but so I've had friends who have actually had this type of encounter in the past, and I'll admit that there is some interest yeah. in the Creator. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily point to no. the God. No, right. So, um, what we've been laying out here is what Paul is talking about in Romans 1 general revelation that has been available to all people at all times that makes you say, hmm, there must be something behind it all. I wonder what that thing is like. I wonder what that, that God is like. And then we need to say, all right, what do you think he's like? Do you think he may be like the Bible's de description of him? And again, we can still go to human instincts. So when I'm in India and, and preaching, I almost always try to preach on the fatherhood of God. Because in Eastern religions, there's just not this concept of a God who calls you his child 
and who loves you and adopts you into his family. And we deeply long for that. So people will describe God as a force, an impersonal Star Wars sort of thing. And I will say, is that really satisfying to you? Is that really what you feel like you would love for God to be like? And, and maybe you don't believe in this God in the Bible, but wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a God who loves us like a husband loves a wife or a father loves a child and who gives himself to save us? Wouldn't that be awesome? If you don't believe it's true, don't you at least wish it were true that a God like this really is? And if so, why don't you give it the, your best shot to actually consider that it, it may be true? And then, we, so we move to special revelation once we, we get general revelation convincing us, yeah, there must be God. Now we say, so what is he like? And let's consider this description of what he's like, that he even sends his own son to die for us. That, so we can move to special revelation explanation. Um, so you're drawn to someone, so you want to know him. And this is the drawing. This is, a, oh, I would love to know the creator. I wonder what he's like. Let me consider this explanation of what he's like. See, that's sort of the process. Good. One more comment, question. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, so you know how we're talking about, like, where does morality come from? Yeah. So, like, when people are atheists or, like, they, you know, claim to not really have the general yeah, yeah. morality um, What about, like, laws? Like, like, you know how laws kind of tend to be based off of, like, morality? Like, how does that really work for people? Yeah, so the whole idea... Like, Right, so the whole idea of laws is, have always been based off the idea that let's have laws that represent natural law. This very thing that we recognize is true. That human beings just about universally recognize is true. So let's have laws on the books that represent what we call natural law. What human beings generally say, yeah, it, it's right to not take other people's stuff. Let's, put the, let's write that down and get that and, and actually punish you if, you if you don't obey that one. We do it all the time. But the idea has always been that they're not mere conventions. They actually align with what's called natural law, which is exactly what we're talking about, this sense of right and wrong that human beings have. That's why it's getting so unmoored from anything substantive and that we adhere to beyond our immediate subjective opinion that, that we see a disintegration in culture and society because laws are going out the window because they're disconnected from anything that's fundamental anymore. Yeah, that's, that's the... But then we say, okay, so let's, let's get back to this idea of something that is true and our laws then need to reflect what's true Rather than just saying, no, just make it up as you go. <gasps> and everyone does what is right in his own eyes, and we've got nothing but Lord of the Flies. My daughter just went to that play the other night at her high school. Okay, honey, I dropped her off. Go watch kids kill each other. Good. It, it, but, but the idea is, yeah, you, you just do your own thing. We'll see what happens. See how, tell me how that goes. And it doesn't go well. Yeah, good stuff. Let me pray. Lord, thank you that you have revealed yourself. Thank you that you have created us in your image and you have instilled in us uh, deep desires and longings and understandings of things that although we suppress it, it's there nonetheless. Help us, Lord, to not try to vanquish our desires but satisfy our desires in you. Lord, help us to see that ultimately <clears throat> your revelation of yourself is in the face of Christ and our joy and our satisfaction is in Jesus. And who he is and what he's done for us. So Lord, help us to uh, seek fulfillment in our deepest longings in you and in what Jesus has done for us. Thank you, Lord, for this good morning we've spent. I pray that we would have a good rest of the day thinking about how glorious you are, how good you are, and that we would walk in newness of life and an awareness of your presence with us and your revelation of yourself all around us whether it's at the beach or the mountains or 99 Ranch Market or wherever you have us, Lord. Help us to see you revealing yourself everywhere we turn our eyes. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.